So, touting equality and equity for all, progressivism is the most prominent social ideology of today. Duh, it's everywhere. But how much do you really know about its history? Let's go all the way back. Prepare for some weapons-grade social history ooftonium. Prohibition. The liberal movement? Most people think of prohibition as the movement of uppity conservatives, snooty Christians and the like. That assumption is incorrect. From humanevents.com, public broadcasting service viewers have been treated this past week to the debut of Ken Burns and Lynn Novick's documentary, Prohibition. The talking heads decry the religious fundamentalist root of the prohibition argument and ridicule hypocrites who supported prohibition but didn't believe in government spending to enforce it. They can't escape their policies, but they can't escape history either. People commonly think of prohibition as a conservative movement. Not at all, historian William Luchtenberg remarks during the five-hour documentary. It was a movement that was embraced by progressives. The documentary emphasizes the interchangeability between the suffragists and the prohibitionists. Yeah, they got the women's movement too. It doesn't quite capture how the dry cause ran with the current of the progressive era rather than against it. Crusades to save the world with democracy, to save future generations through eugenics, and to save the slum through social gospel missionaries echoed Prohibition's redemptive rhetoric to rescue the drunk. It is a wonder that people so obsessed with their fellow man's imperfections actually fell for visions of human perfectibility. More unequivocal on the question were the capital P progressives, whose state parties endorsed national prohibition in Michigan, Iowa, Indiana, Kansas, North Dakota, Utah, Oklahoma, Georgia, New Mexico, Vermont, Maine, and points beyond. The Progressive Party, its Ohio affiliate boasted in 1914, is the only political party this year that stands for state and nationwide prohibition. All right, so now that your brain has been primed to understand the true history of this stuff, let's move on to the next big subject, immigration, from Mises.org. Nativism is usually associated with the right, but that shouldn't be the case for these progressives. The AFL supported the 1882 and 1924 Immigration Restriction Acts against the Chinese. In fact, many progressive labor unions were very racist, nativist, and nationalist. Even the second incarnation of the KKK in the early 20th century, aside from being quite racist, was also in favor of many progressive reforms. Abortion advocate and progressive hero Margaret Sanger even gave a speech at one of the KKK's rallies. Side note on racism. The labor unions of yesteryear, bastions of progressivism, have a sordid history of failure to confront racism within themselves and outright promotion of it all over the country. Ouch. Sorry folks, but this train keeps on rolling. Touchy subject station up ahead. Eugenics. Contrary to the popular belief spread by the radical scientists, eugenics for much of the 20th century was a favorite cause of the left, not the right. It was championed by many progressives, liberals, and socialists, including Theodore Roosevelt, H.G. Wells, Emma Goldman, George Bernard Shaw, Harold Lasky, John Maynard Keynes, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, Margaret Sanger, and the Marxist biologists J.B.S. Haldane and Herman Muller. It's not hard to see why the sides lined up this way. Conservative Catholics and Bible Belt Protestants hated eugenics because it was an attempt by intellectual and scientific elites to play God. Progressives loved eugenics because it was on the side of reform rather than the status quo, activism rather than laissez-faire, and social responsibility rather than selfishness. Now, many aspects of these movements still linger today, but they're all underpinned by the big mama, communism. What progress is and what reaction is depend very much on where you start and where you want to go. If equality is the goal, as many self-described progressives say it is, then any progress toward equality should be considered, well, progress. If that is the case, shouldn't communism be the most progressive cause of all? Communism was certainly considered as such by many intellectuals in the past. Indeed, Karl Marx saw history as a sort of march of progress, primitive communism to slave society, to feudalism, to mercantilism, to capitalism, to socialism, and finally to communism. And the Soviet Union certainly executed its fair share of reactionaries and counter-revolutionaries. 
Well, over at Salon, Jesse Meyerson wants to tell you why you're wrong about communism. And Sean McElway at the Rolling Stone highlights why Marx was right, because he foresaw the horror of iPhones. Whoopi Goldberg thinks that, at least, it's a great concept. Former Obama White House Communications Director Anita Dunn referred to Mao Zedong as one of her favorite political philosophers, whom Howard Zinn lauded for creating the closest thing in the long history of China to a people's government. Back in 1984, Jesse Jackson gave a speech in Havana titled, Viva Fidel. Robert Redford went scuba diving with said dictator, and Steven Spielberg described the time he spent with Castro as the most important eight hours of my life. Hollywood even made a four and a half hour, two-part propaganda film about Che Guevara back in 2008. The left's mushy and ambivalent view toward communism may be best summed up by Daniel Singer, when writing for The Nation back in 1995, wanted to highlight both sides, the enthusiasm, construction, and the spread of education and social advancement, along with the less pleasant things such as mass murder. So you see, progressivism has a long and complicated history. Often progressive action ends up on the wrong side of history, against the sanctity of human life, happiness, and real progress in anything but our own self-inflicted extermination.